Well, thank you, Brother Jared, and uh, good morning, brothers and sisters. We're going to now conclude our studies by looking at the honour that it is for the saints to be involved in the things that will follow that two or three years that has been the special focus uh, of our study. But I'm going to start, actually, with just reminding you of that word indignation in Isaiah 26 and verse 20, where it says, Come, my people, you'll recall that we were here uh, yesterday talking about the bridal chamber, the rejoicing of Christ with his bride for that 12-month period where he will do no preparation for war, no work, no business, just meeting every member of his bride and rejoicing with them, individually and collectively. It says in that 20th verse, Come, my people, enter into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee. Hide thyself, as it were, for a little moment, the twinkling of an eye that we referred to yesterday, until the indignation be overpassed. And then verse 21 tells us that Yahweh comes forth. And clearly verse 21 is about Armageddon. And we know that when Christ comes forth for Armageddon, he won't come alone. So therefore is that period of seclusion in the bridal chamber and verse 21 is a reference to coming out of Sinai to make their way to the sanctuary and the, the, the rest of course is well known. It's very important therefore to understand what this indignation is. It's actually the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation upon the earth which begins with the resurrection. So while we're secluded, brothers and sisters, this world's going to go through a traumatic period that it's never known in its history. And that's saying something, isn't it? It's never known a time of trauma like the one that's going to descend upon it when we are gone. Sad in a way because it's the beginning of the divine judgments upon humanity for their waywardness and their wickedness. And that's why God will have no problem in unleashing the monster upon this world that they've created for themselves. There will be no light in the earth. Isaiah 60, gross darkness will cover the earth. There will be no need for him to have some kind of control for the sake of the saints. And Paul tells us, all things are for your sakes. That will be taken away. See? And so Daniel chapter 12 is very important. I want you to come to Daniel 12. because It tells us something about this time period. <clears throat> Daniel 12 verses 1 and 2, of course, makes reference to the work of Michael. It's our Lord Jesus Christ as judge. And the, the significant phrase here is the phrase that, that you read in the very first line of verse 1 of Daniel 12, at that time. Now you'll see that's repeated towards the end of verse 1 again. At that time. So what time? Well, the context tells you context of the previous verses in chapter 11 clearly indicate this is the time of divine judgments, the, the time of Armageddon, the, the invasion of the north, the establishment of the tent of their power between the seas and my glorious holy mountain, and then the destruction of the Gogian confederacy. It's the time of the end, isn't it? Well, who's the Michael here? At that time shall Michael stand up. Well, obviously, it's our Lord Jesus Christ who now takes over the role of Michael to forgive and condemn and to determine destinies. And he comes to raise the dead. That's obvious, isn't it, from verse 1? And it talks about, he will stand up for the children of thy people. Then there's this time of trouble such as never was. And then it says at the end of verse 1, and at that time thy people shall be delivered, everyone that shall be found written in the book. And the book here, of course, is the book of life, isn't it? It's clearly the book of life. And then verse 2 tells us, and many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. That's the judgment seat. So there's no doubt about the context. So therefore what we are being told is the judgment seat process follows in verses 2 and 3. This is all 10 years prior to Armageddon, that the resurrection era is the period when the time of trouble begins. Now, is that new? No. Brother Mansfield in the expositor, the Daniel expositor, says this. Daniel 12 verse 1, the word trouble. He says the Hebrew word for trouble, zara, indicates intense turmoil, comparable to the pain endured by a woman bearing her first child, used in Jeremiah 4.31. It describes the terror of a people who cowered in fear before a merciless, rapacious army. Note the usage of the word in Habakkuk 3, Zephaniah 1, Zechariah 10. The same word appears in Jeremiah 30 of the time of Jacob's trouble. 
Thus the Lord will return at a time of unparalleled chaos involving both Israel and the Gentiles. And he gives a list of references. It will be an age of spiritual and moral gloom with mankind in a state of gross darkness. There's your Isaiah 60 reference. The trouble will be so intense that there will seem to be no way out as the word perplexity in Luke 21, 25 signifies and that phrase actually applies more to the time after our removal than it does to the time before our removal and yet we can see that today, can't we? The nation's in a state of perplexity. It's going to get worse, much worse. It goes on to say, with men's hearts failing them for fear as they contemplate the catastrophe that faces them. There's going to be a general breakdown in order. The saints, however, have already been removed from this scene of chaos for the time of trouble will erupt as the judgment seat is in progress. So what precedes this time of trouble? The moment of our removal, the, the time of the resurrection of the dead and our personal removal as those who are alive and remain, that's when it's triggered. What's going to happen, brothers and sisters? Well, I think we know. Let me ask this question. What will conditions in the world be like just before the return of Christ to raise the dead? Now we have some who are saying, based on, I think, misreading of certain passages, and certainly there's a tendency in the, in the churches around us to, to say there's a time of great tribulation coming for the world, and they wrongly interpret Matthew 24. There's a tendency to say, well, you know, we might have to face some very hard times, brothers and sisters, before Christ comes. Forget it. It ain't going to happen. You know why we can be absolutely confident? Because Christ says it's not going to happen. That's good enough for me. He says it's not going to happen. So the, to, the, to the question, will there be poverty and hard times or general prosperity at the time when he sends his angels to raise the dead and then to collect us, the answer is very clearly laid out. Luke 17, I want you to join me in Luke 17, verses 26 to 30. Luke 21, verse 34, reinforces that. And Revelation chapter 3, verses 14, verse 14, through to the end of that chapter, that's the letter to the Laodiceans, they all suggest the same clear answer, that we will be removed from times of general prosperity in our world. Now I have people come to me and say, but what about the poverty stricken in Africa? And what about, brothers and sisters, look at history. There has never ever been a time in human history when there's been as much prosperity in the world as there is today. Never. Not even the times of Noah, I believe, would have matched what we have today. You can go to Africa and there's a McDonald's on almost every corner. That doesn't mean everybody can afford it, but that's the nature of the world we live in. It is a time of general prosperity. And as Christ said, you're always going to have the poor with you, aren't you? In whatever era it might be, you're always going to have the poor. It doesn't mean that everybody's got to have a million dollars in the bank. He means there's a general prosperity in human society and we have known nothing like it in history. For the last 70 years, it's been unique. And we're right at the end of it because it's about to disappear. So in Luke chapter 17, we have an answer. And we know what this chapter says. I don't, I don't need to work you through the details of it. But if you read it carefully and you read it with the grammar, the grammar here, the, where, verse 27, where it says, they did eat, they drank in the days of Noah, the grammar in the imperfect active should be rendered, they were eating. The imperfect tense is the tense of an action that's begun that's not concluded. You don't finish it. They were eating... They were drinking, they married wives, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered in the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. It was the same for the days of Lot, verse 28. They were eating, they were drinking, they were buying, they were selling, they were planting, they were building. But the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone. So there they were in Sodom on that, on that, that fateful day. The angels had appeared at the house of Lot the evening before, prepared his house to go. They went at morning light, basically. And those in Sodom who got up that morning thought it was just another day like the ones before it. And they went down to the coffee shop to get their latte, but never got to finish it. Because fire and brimstone fell from heaven and all their prosperity disappeared 
in a day. The same happened in Noah's generation, didn't it? So why does the Lord choose Noah, the days of Noah and the days of Lot? He could have chosen any era of divine judgment. He could have chosen the times of Zedekiah, where there was no bread in the city. He could have chosen and said, well, look, it's going to be exactly the match of AD 70, where people were eating other people's bodies to survive, and women were cooking their own children. He could have used that, couldn't he? But he didn't. Why not? Well, because he wanted two eras, or at least one, he got two, two eras that had a common denominator that would be a type of the times in which he would return for a second time. Prosperity. General prosperity in human society. And what were they doing? All of these things. That's why. And that's what the world's doing today, isn't it? It's doing all of those things. And then all their prosperity collapsed in a day when the saints were taken away. And it's going to happen all over again. You had any doubt about that? You need to go to Revelation chapter 3 and verse 17 and have a look at what Christ says about the final ecclesia in the list of seven. You know there's something fascinating about the a letter to the, to the Laodiceans? You would know that in, in Eureka, Brother Thomas shows that the seven letters actually are prophecies of seven periods of time. When Brother H.B. Mansour comes to comment on that, he's slightly different, but he also demonstrates, and very powerfully I think, that from the time of John in AD 96, when the Apocalypse was received, down to our times, is represented by the seven letters, the, the condition of the ecclesias that Christ wrote to. Yes. So Laodicea comes last. Well, yes, we are in the Laodicean era of ecclesial history, brothers and sisters, a time of unparalleled prosperity. Now, how do we know that Christ wants us to interpret it that way? Well, it's the only letter with these words. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. All right? That's clear, isn't it? He's telling us that the condition of the Laodicean ecclesia would be the condition of the brotherhood when he comes in a time of unparalleled prosperity. I hold, I stand at the door and knock. So what was their problem? Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. So there is the warning. We will be taken from times of general prosperity which are about to collapse big time. And a great depression looms, and this is not my words, the world generally knows this is going to happen. And certainly financial experts know it's going to happen. It's a question of timing, whether it's this year or next year, nobody can be certain, but there are a lot of people now saying it's probably going to happen this year. A lot of people are saying that. And in fact, President Obama has a pile of paper on his desk that thick from all of his agencies, CIA, Army, Navy, FBI, a whole range of agencies are all warning him to get ready for civil disobedience in America because there's going to come a 25-year depression. 25-year depression. It will not last for 25 years. It will last for 10. But depressions, you get out of them by wars, and we'll come to that in a moment. So when you look at what's happening here in this country, soaring US debt of 19 trillion, political gridlock, they can't agree on how they're gonna have a cup of tea in the morning, leave alone, leave alone how they're gonna solve their economic problems. A whole series of quantitative easing, which doesn't work for very long because it erodes the value of your currency. Rising interest rates, which the Fed is now warning, has to happen soon. That's what caused the 1930 depression, you know that? They put interest rates up because they were virtually zero, People were taking advantage of it, so they put the interest rates up. It's going to happen again. Collapse is coming to the US and it's coming to the world. Wherever you look in our world, you've got the European, European Union situation with all of those countries. We know there are many more than those listed. Greece, Cyprus, Spain, Italy, France, they're all on the verge, if not already bankrupt. And when this collapse comes, it's going to be huge dislocation. The European Central Bank, of course, has now further tried to bail out uh, Greece. They've already had 445 billion euros that they've given to Greece that they're never going to get back. All right, and they're now giving them more. It's going to bankrupt the European Central Bank. 
and they're turning to measures like quantitative easing because they can't lower the interest rates anymore. China and Russia sign financial oil and gas and military deals that cut the US dollar out of their international trade. So the US dollar shortly will not be the international currency for trading in commodities. And that will mean the collapse of the US Federal Treasury because they will not be able to finance those dollars that have to come back to it. Simple as that. So when this happens, we don't know. The angels have been holding it for some time now. And those of you who know me know I've been saying this for a long, long time. And it's just not happened yet, but it's so close now, so close, that the world is telling us it's about to happen. So it will happen, and it will be the biggest depression in human history. It will bring the time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation upon earth. And all the Greek crisis continues to simmer, I think that will be a catalyst in the whole process. So what happens in depressions? Well, 29th of October, 1929, a stock market crash in Wall Street, and finally it filtered down and by 1930 we had a depression. A worldwide depression. And you get out of depressions by getting people back to work, and the only way to get them back to work is to fight a war, to have a war, you can put them back to make weapons and armaments, and wars also reduce the number of mouths you've got to feed, so this is how you get out of depressions. That's what happened, didn't it? Second World War came along in 1939. Ten years after the stock market collapse. Okay, there's a pattern there, isn't there? Very clear pattern. We've been talking about ten years, haven't we? During the course of this week. So whether it be 2015 or 16, we don't know. Maybe, who knows? I don't know. But it's near. There will start this time of trouble such as never was. And the times of prosperity will become that time of trouble. And how do you get out of it? Well, you go to war. Yeah, and that war, I believe, will be Armageddon. So it's probably only about 10 years away, Armageddon, 10 plus years. So how do we know that this is the last cycle? I've had people say to me, but oh, you know, we could go into a depression, 25 year depression. We could go into a depression, and then we could come out the other side and get back to prosperity. Yeah, you need large quantities of oil. Mm -hmm. You need large quantities of a lot of things. That's not gonna happen. But it's not gonna happen because we know from scripture that the papacy has to come to its final end in 2060. That is the only fixed date that I know, and it will be certain. You want the details on that, you can find that by going to talks that have been done on that subject. 2060 is the termination of the papacy. It'll be gone in that year. And that's not that very far away, is it, when you think about it. So there won't be another cycle. This is the last cycle brothers and sisters. Just uh, while you're in Luke 17, have a look at what he says here. In verse 31 he says, well verse 30, he says, even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now, you may have heard me talk about this, but you see, there's something curious about the way the Lord presents this. He actually uses this word day, singular, and days ten times. Five are singular, and five are plural. Now, what's he talking about? Well, the day obviously is the day of reckoning, the day of judgment, but days, plural, is the days of opportunity. So the days of Noah, 120 years, were days of opportunity to, for people to get their act together. The days of Lot were days of opportunity before the judgment came, but then the day came. And he talks about the days of the Son of Man. We are, I believe, basically in that period of the days of opportunity like those given to Noah's generation. But then comes the day. Five. Why five singular and five plural? Well, five is the number of grace. If you use the days of opportunity, then they'll be, wisely I mean, they'll be days of grace. Use them unwisely, they're otherwise. And if you use the days of opportunity wisely, then when the day comes, you'll receive divine grace. And that day is coming. Look at verse 30. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop, and they used the housetop in ancient times for prayer and meditation. He was upon the housetop and his stuff, and the word stuff there, skuios, means implements, equipment, apparatus, or gadgets. His stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. 
He that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife, he says. And so there's the classic exhortation, which we're all familiar with. Then he says, and I'll come back to this verse in a moment, verse 33. We'll come back to that in a moment. Verse 34, he says this. I tell you, in that night, isn't that strange? Ten times he's used the term days and day, and now he says, I tell you in that night. So what's he doing here, brothers and sisters? Well, he's alluding to Genesis chapter 19 and verse 1. Because the angels came to the house of Lot in the evening. And that's when they're going to come to your house. They will come in the evening when you can most expect people to be home. Now, Australia is 17 hours in front of North America, or at least the west coast of North America. It reduces as you go further east, of course. We're 17 hours in front. So there's an expectation, I think, that the angels are actually going to turn up at my house before they turn up at yours. Do not expect a phone call from me or an email. I will be otherwise engaged. We might say that sort of jokingly, but I think you can see there's an exhortation in that. We need to be ready, brothers and sisters. It's going to happen soon. And the closer we get to the edge of the precipice, the financial precipice, the closer we are to that moment. When these angels will turn up at our place in the evening, when you can most expect everybody to be home. Now, that's not going to be the case in every situation, but generally speaking, it will be. So that night is clearly a reference back to Genesis 19. And then it says this in, in verse 34. I tell you in that night there shall be two, and of course the word men is in italics, it can be crossed out, there shall be two in one bed, the one shall be taken and the other left. Now, he's just been talking about Lot's wife. He's just been directing you back to Genesis 19. This is about husband and wife, both of whom are in the truth, both of whom will be held responsible, both of whom are going to be removed from where they are, and both of whom will be at the judgment seat. So what does he mean when he says the one should be taken and the other left? Well, he can't mean left behind, can he? He certainly can't mean left behind. There's two grinding, two labouring to feed others in the truth. Although you can't find Lot's wife doing any work when the angels turn up to feed them. Lot does the whole lot. The one should be taken yeah, the Greek word is paralambano. And it means to receive near or to associate with oneself. It speaks of a very intimate relationship. It's used in the scripture of one taking a wife to himself. And that's the word that is used in Matthew chapter 1 and verses 20 and 24 when the angel comes to a very agitated Joseph and says, Fear not to take unto thee thy wife. Mary, even though she is with child. Take her unto thee. That's the word. It means to take someone into a marriage. Lot is going into the marriage. Lot is going to the right hand. He's a righteous man. Peter tells us that in 2 Peter 2. Who vexed his righteous soul with the behaviour of the world as it was in his day. As we should. We should take umbrage at the decisions that are being made by the US Supreme Court and will now be picked up by all the states of America in due course. Even the religious Bible Belt states will go down that path. We should be disturbed about that and what it will do to human society. We should be disturbed about the fact that Tel Aviv is the capital of homosexuality in Europe today. All right? He vexed his righteous heart with the behaviour of the wicked in his time. So, he goes to the right hand, but his wife goes to the left at the judgment seat. And it says, the other shall be left. Well, guess what the word is in the Greek, brothers and sisters? It's aphiami. It means to send forth, to leave, to depart from, to abandon. And it's used of separation in marriage. 
And that's the word that Paul uses in 1 Corinthians 7 verse 11, 12 and 13 when he's talking about a man putting away his wife. Let him not put her away. It's about someone being thrown out of a marriage. And that's what's going to happen to Lot's wife. She's going to be thrown out of the marriage. She's going to the left. And that's why she's such a wonderful exhortation for us who live in these prosperous times in the latter days where decisions have to be made as to what you're going to give priority to in life. As it gets harder and harder to live by the standards that we've been used to, more and more sacrifices have got to be made and it's usually the truth that gets sacrificed in the process. That's what he's talking about and that's the lesson we're going to see in a moment. Now they ask this question, where Lord? You see that in Luke 17, verse 37. They answered and said unto him, where Lord? And what they mean by that is, where will they be left? And the answer is, like Lot's wife in the place they preferred to be. And of course for the generation of AD 70, where did they go? Did they obey the Lord's words to flee Jerusalem and to go somewhere else? Many did and they fled across Jordan and they went to Pella but those who said, oh no, we want to stay here and this is our security, this is, this is what we've got used to, you know, we want to stay here in Jerusalem. Two million of them did that. Most of them perished, at least one million of them perished. That's where they were left, whether the Roman eagles were gathered together. So the principle here is if you love your present circumstances too much and that's what you prefer, that's where you're left, so to speak. His wife looked back from behind him and she became a pillar of salt, Genesis 19.26. Now this is the verse that I think we should focus on, verse 33. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. What does that mean? Well, it's pretty simple in the context, isn't it? If you are prepared to put the truth last or second because you want to preserve what you have or what you think you should have or you want more, in other words, you're going to save this life say what you've got now, then don't expect to get the reward of immortality. But if you're prepared to lose your life today, and there are circumstances that come across our lives, aren't there, where you're going to end up losing everything. I know people in that position. Lost their jobs, house burnt down, no insurance, whatever it might be prepared to make sure that the truth doesn't get relegated, then you'll save your life for the future. It's pretty simple, isn't it? And the choice is ours. One goes to the right, taken into a marriage. One goes to the left, kicked out of the marriage. That's his solemn lesson. Just one little point on Daniel chapter 12, by the way. You know, there's, there's an interesting thing in Daniel 12, <clears throat> well I couldn't resist this, it really doesn't, it didn't need to be said but I couldn't resist it. When it says of course in verse 3 that the reward of the righteous is that they that be wise or they that, they who make wise, this, uh, this is about people who devote their lives to the education of others, whether that be children or others, they that make wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament and they that turn many to righteousness, and there's the proof that that's what it means, they that turn many to righteousness shall shine as the stars forever and ever. But thou, O Daniel, shut, but shut up the words and seal the book until, as it should read, until the time of the end, many shall run to and fro and knowledge shall be increased. Now tomorrow, Brother Deb will be on an airplane running to and fro from Medford to LA and back to Toronto, back home. And then a week later, he's gonna get on an aeroplane from Toronto to Kelowna and he's gonna do another Bible school. I won't tell you what our itinerary is. We are running to and fro and people say, oh, well, that's what it means. We've got this running to and fro all over the earth. There's all this travel going on and this knowledge is increasing exponentially. It doesn't actually mean that. It doesn't actually mean that. 
Jesenius says the word rendered run, rendered run to and fro, this Hebrew word shoot is used metaphorically to run through a book and to examine thoroughly. And Brother Mansfield comments this way in the expositor. He says, it is nevertheless true, and he's talked about you know, the fact that there may be some connection with the hyperactivity of modern society. He says this, nevertheless true also that the scriptures have been opened up to a greater extent than formerly. Printed expositions and commentaries abound and the passage of history has verified most prophetic details, yet there is a lack of true understanding. So you in that class? Are you in the class that are turning many to righteousness, teaching and educating, whether that be your children, in the ecclesia, in your Sunday school, wherever it may be? Are you in that class? Well, yeah, there's a reward for that. But you can only do that effectively if you're running to and fro through the book. And I can be, I'm very, very thankful that when I come to places like this, I've got a teenage group out there and I told them this today, I've, I've done a lot of Bible schools in my time, a lot. I do five or six a year. I had a lot of teenage groups in that time. Some of them I couldn't get out of there fast enough. But that group there, I'd do three sessions with them in the morning, happily, and leave you people here bereft. All right? And Uncle Deb will tell you that that's true. Wonderful group of kids, shouldn't use that term, young people who are learning to run to and fro through the book. And you know who's responsible for that? People sitting in this audience. Keep it up. Because there is a reward. And that reward will be on the right hand. Now, I want to just move on to the saints' role in the military campaigns of Christ. You know, again, we have people in our community who say, oh, no, the saints, they're going to be immortalised. Some people believe that they won't be immortalised until after Armageddon. But, you know, there are people who say, the saints will be immortalised and they'll be sort of closeted away and kept there privately while Christ and the angels go out and defeat the nations. And then when it's all very comfortable, the saints come in and sit down in an armchair. I mean, I'm being exaggerated. But that's the kind of stuff we're hearing. It's not going to happen. All right? It's not going to happen. And there are many testimonies in Scripture about that. Malachi 4 is one of them. Now, this is the, this is the chapter just after Malachi 3.16, remember? When they, when they go into the book, their record. Yeah, these are the people that are in that record. For behold, the day cometh that shall burn as an oven, and all the proud, yea, that all that do wickedly, and that's a reference back to chapter 3, shall be stubble. And the day that cometh shall burn them up, saith Yahweh of armies, that it shall leave them neither root nor branch. And then it says this in verse 3. Now between that, of course, you've got the gambling we spoke about. Remember that? The cars being released from the stall and bouncing around. Yeah, well, this is the next thing, verse 3. And ye shall tread down the wicked. You know, this is the calves being released from the stall, the immortal saints. Ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet. In the day that I shall do this, saith Yahweh of armies. And Paul chimes in in Romans 16 and 20 and he says, And the God of peace shall bruise Satan under your feet shortly. And if that wasn't sufficient, and there are many of these references, we've got Christ's words before Pilate. In John 18 verse 36, Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world, of this order. If my kingdom were of this order, then would my servants fight? So when he's, he does come to establish his kingdom, guess what his servants are going to be doing? They're going to be involved in that warfare to establish the kingdom. I want you to come to Psalm 149, because this is another passage. It's very, very plain about this. But it's also very important in relation to what is happening in the bridal chamber. Psalm 149. This is what's going on in the bridal chamber. Praise ye Yahweh, sing unto Yahweh a new song. Let's stop there. You'll find that phrase, a new song, used nine times in Scripture. Look at it carefully. It indicates that this is a song that can only be sung with full meaning by immortal people. We know the words of these songs, some of them, don't we? We know from Revelation 5 the words of the song. Thou hast made us kings and priests, etc. 
We're told at the end of Revelation uh, chapter 5 of the song that will be sung not only by saints but by angels. So the words are known. But there's no way you can sing it today as you'll sing it tomorrow. All right. This is a song for immortal beings. And you know, I'll come to a reference here in Psalm 149 and we'll tell you what this really means in a moment. And it says, Sing unto Yahweh a new song, his praise in the congregation. This is the, the Old Testament equivalent for the New Testament ecclesia. In the ecclesia of saints. Let Israel rejoice in him that made him. Let the children of Zion be joyful in their king. Let them praise his name in the dance. Well, who are these people? Well, they're the saints, it says. Well, these saints, that word in the Hebrew is chashid. It's cognate with kesed, C-H-E-S-E-D. And kesed, of course, is the Hebrew word that is used in Exodus 34, verse 6, for that aspect of the divine character of mercy and grace and loving kindness. So Rotherham translates this word, men of loving kindness. What does that mean? Well, they're manifestations of the character of God. That's why they're there. They're actually manifestations of the... That's what saints means here. It goes on to say they, they rejoice in the dance. And this is not talking about line dancing to country and western music. This is talking about people who are so overjoyed and thrilled by what has happened to them, by the release from the machinations of human nature and all of its pain and sorrow and troubles, that they can't hold themselves in. It's not possible. They're bouncing around. It's the round dance. And you, did, you see, did you see the images when Israel was made a nation state in 1948, what the Jews did in the streets of Tel Aviv? And they got into little groups and they're holding hands and they're bouncing around in such joy. There wasn't any order to it, really, was there? It wasn't as though they were sort of doing the... You know, the sort of steps you see in dancing. It was the fact that they were just overjoyed. And that's how we're going to be, brothers and sisters. I look forward to that. I won't mind holding hands with Jonathan and bouncing up and down. <laughs> and then it says this in verse 4. Yahweh taketh pleasure in his people. He will beautify the meek with salvation. I think that's one of the most extraordinary and lovely phrases in the Bible. Beautify. The word in the, in the Hebrew means to glorify or to beautify or, or to adorn. Meek. This is the, this is the idea of, of the meekness that Moses manifested because of the 21 occurrences of this word in the Old Testament. The very first of those is in Numbers 12 verse 3 that Moses was the meekest man upon the earth. Doesn't mean he wasn't, wasn't assertive, does it? Doesn't mean he didn't have convictions. It meant that he humbled himself under the mighty hand of God. All right, that's what it means. He will beautify the meek with salvation. I need to be beautified, by the way, and probably some of you do too. <laughs> I can see Larry agrees with that. Yeah, but won't that be wonderful to be beautified? Because you are meek. And they are joyful, verse 5. Let the saints be joyful in glory. Let them sing aloud upon their beds. Let the high praises of ale be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. This is the word here, joyful. It means to jump for joy. Like Abraham did. Abraham saw my day and he rejoiced. The Greek word means he jumped for joy. He saw my day. <laughs> Won't that be terrific? When we're released from this nature and in the company of those who have shared the wonderful things that we have loved in our probation. And we're there with Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all the saints of the past. And you're not going to need rest. It says in verse 5, they're joyful upon their beds. That doesn't mean a double bed or even a single bed. It means a recliner, a couch. Yeah. So we won't need sleep as immortals, but you will recline in the company of your brothers and sisters and rejoice together and talk together in a way that we can't do today. Verse 6 it says, I should comment on the sword, shouldn't I, in, in verse 6, and I will in a moment. It says, 
in verse 6. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. Mouth doesn't really mean mouth. The Hebrew word is garon. It means the neck or the throat. And so Rotherham translates it, the high songs of God be in their throat. Why would that be the case? Well, I'm, I'm speaking to you and largely what you're hearing is coming from the top, from the top of my mouth. Right, and it's projected out to you. But what if I get down here right, and speak from my throat? What do you reckon that means? I'm, it's not going to be gruff like that. But it means it's coming from my whole being. That's the indication. It's coming from my whole being. It's not just words. This is coming out of me from my being. That's what's going to happen to us, brothers and sisters. And a two-edged sword. Now, this is not the two-edged sword you go around flailing and cutting people's heads off like ISIS. All right? It's got nothing to do with a two-edged sword. We know what the two-edged sword is a symbol of in the Word of God. It's the symbol of the power of the Spirit of God, isn't it? And the Word of God is described that way. So the saints are going to go out with, like the angels today with the power of the Spirit of God at their fingertips. And when they speak a word, let there be fire and brimstone or let there be a flood, that's what's going to happen, just like the angels do, because they'll have control of the power of Almighty God. That's what it means. Using the Spirit to overthrow the unrighteous. And then it says this, to, bind, to, to execute vengeance, vengeance upon the nations and punishments upon the people, verse 7, to bind their kings with chains and fetters of iron, to execute upon them the judgment written, this honour have all his saints. Some point in the scheme of things, before the kingdom is fully established, we're all going to play a part in the establishment of that kingdom. But parents are going to have the role, firstly, if they've got young children or younger children, their primary and initial role is going to be to complete the upbringing of their children. Very quickly, I've only got seven minutes or so to go. Very quickly, we want to deal with this matter at the end of our studies. So let's ask some questions. The relation of young people to judgment. Many of you in this hall have got children, true. I've got 12 grandchildren. None of them baptised yet. 17 down to 18 months. I have an interest in this subject. What will happen to young people too young to be baptised when Christ returns? And what about babies and the unborn? We've got a couple of those in, in, in this audience. And what is the age of responsibility if there is such a thing? And what will happen to those who have reached it but have not been baptised at Christ's return? And what are children whose parents have both rejected the judgment seat? They're, they're reasonable questions, aren't they? And there are biblical answers for all of them. We can't go into all of those, of course, at this point, but we will go into one or two. The fate of children whose parents are rejected the judgment seat. One thing we can be assured of is that Abraham's statement in Genesis 18.25 will prove correct. Shall not the Lord of all the earth do right? The judge of all the earth will do right, and he will. So where children are embraced by and or follow the parents' ungodly example, destruction awaits them on the principle of Deuteronomy 20, verses 16 to 18. That was the divine rule of the past. But where children stand for God despite the parents' faulty leadership, they will be preserved and given an opportunity. That we know from the story of the sons of Korah, who stood aside from their father, who was, who was to be appointed the captain to lead Israel back to Egypt. They stood aside. Now, we don't know their exact ages, but there may have been some quite young people there. There may, some, may have been some older brothers. We don't know. But we do know this, that they were not prepared to go their father's way. And Yahweh rewarded them, not only by preserving them, but by making them doorkeepers in the house. You know, I haven't got time to take you back to Psalm 68. But you want to have a look at Psalm 68, verses 5 to 10 one day, especially verses 5 and 6. You know what it says? Psalm 68, brothers and sisters, is, a, is an Armageddon psalm. It's about Yahweh going, let his enemies be scattered before him. It's all about blood and thunder and dead bodies. And, and it says this, that in the act of judgment, Yahweh is a father to the fatherless and a judge of the widows. 
I wonder what he means. Does he mean just, literal, fatherless? Or does, does he mean perhaps spiritually fatherless because parents haven't done the right thing? Does he mean sisters who have been abandoned by Christadelphian husbands? Or vice versa? Well, I want you to come to Isaiah 40. But in the act of judgment, Yahweh sets the solitary in families, says Psalm 68 and verse 6. He sets the solitary in families. Now Isaiah 40 is quoted in the New Testament and in the margin we'll tell you there's a list of passages there where verses 3 to 5 have been quoted in the New Testament about the first advent of Christ. And then you come to verse 9 and it says this, O Zion, that bring us good tidings, get thee up into the high mountain. O Jerusalem, that bring us good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength, lift it up, be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, behold your God. Now you could apply those words, couldn't you, to the first advent. But what is the context here? Well, we'll just read the next verse. The next verse is verse 10. It says this. Behold, Adonai Yahweh will come with strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him and his work before him. What language is that? Second advent, isn't it? This is the work of Christ in his second advent. Did he come with a strong arm to bring judgment upon the nations in his first? No. Second advent. Did he come to give rewards? No. But he is coming to give rewards. So we know the context. It's second advent. So then read on to verse 11. It says this. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those that are with young and the margin says those that give suck who have got newborn children newborn babies now the kids here are not four-legged variety they're two-legged they're children so whose children well it says he shall feed his flock like a shepherd these are the people who belong to his flock. All right? This is the brotherhood. This is the Christadelphian community. This is those who are found at the end serving God. So there's care. Christ is going to take care, not just for mothers with young children, but children per se that belong to Christadelphians, that belong to his flock. I want you to come to Ezekiel 47. This is the context of the division of the land after Armageddon. It's the inheritance of Abraham and his seed and of the tribes of Israel who will receive equally. Now there are seven portions or cantons or divisions above the Holy Oblation and five beneath. And you've probably heard me say it before. If I was doing it, I would have had six above and six below, but God doesn't do it that way. He puts seven above and five below. I wonder why. Seven, amongst other things, is the covenant number of Abraham's covenant, and this is Abraham's land. All right? And if you want to get into it, you get there by works? No. You get there by divine grace. So there are seven tribes above and five below. And this is what it says in Ezekiel 47. It says this, Verse 21 is talking about dividing the land according to the tribes of Israel. Verse 22 says, And it shall come to pass that ye shall divide it by lot from inheritance unto you and to the strangers that sojourn among you, which shall beget children among you, and they shall be unto you as born in the country among the children of Israel. They shall, they shall have inheritance with you among the tribes of Israel. So who are they? Well, the first thing you notice is that they're Gentiles. They're not Israelites. And this is not talking about the Chinese turning up in the kingdom age and saying, look, we much prefer this land to China. Sorry, Chinese live in China. This is not about foreigners turning up in the land. That's clear. And it says that these people who are Gentiles are sojourners that beget children among you. So they, they don't live forever. They're sojourning and they actually can have children which means that they're not immortal because the saints will not the saints will not be able to have children stop you silly thing so they're mortals okay 
And they're regarded as being born in the country, it says. They're sojourning, but, but though they sojourn in the land, they are counted as Israelites. Yeah. Now, who could they be? Well, Brother Roberts had no problem with it. He wrote extensively on this. They can only be, brothers and sisters, the children of Christadelphian parents. There's no other option. That's who they are. So when Christ comes and he sends his angels and knocks on your door, just like Lot, his two daughters, who, by the way, weren't all that salubrious in their behaviour, went with Lot and his wife. Your children are going to go with you to the judgment seat. But they're going to be too young, most of them, to be held responsible or accountable so they won't appear before Christ. So what's going to happen to them? Well, if one of their parents goes into the kingdom, they go into the land. And they will have an inheritance amongst the tribes of Israel, but it won't be any ordinary inheritance. You know that? Because the next verse tells you that. Verse 23, it says this. It shall come to pass that in what tribe the stranger sojourneth, there shall ye give him his inheritance, saith Adonai Yahweh. Now that doesn't happen to the Jews. Dan is up here, Gad's down there, Judah's just north of the Holy Oblation and Benjamin's to the south. If you belong to, to Dan, sorry, you're up here. You have no choice. God knows you belong to the tribe of Dan, you're up there. You belong to Gad, you're down here. You enjoy fishing, that's not too bad because you've got the Euphrates up here and you've got the, you know, the Gulf of Aqaba and whatever down there. But you do not go into any other tribe's canton. But these people do, because it says, wherever they want to be, except in the Holy Oblation and the Prince's portion, because that's given to the saints, wherever they want to be in that land, they have a right to be there. That is a privilege that God does not afford to his own people, the natural seed of Abraham. Think about that, brothers and sisters. We serve a God who looked down the corridor and knew that at the end of the days, before he sent his son, there would be many faithful people in the earth preserving the truth and raising their children in right ways. And he made provision for them. What a God we serve. Just very quickly... My time is well and truly up, but I just want to just take you very quickly through one or two more slides, if you don't mind. There's a timeline for Christadelphian children. We have some mothers with young children in this Bible school, and we have others who are carrying babies. So let's say that Christ comes in late 2015, and that's not by any means beyond the realms of possibility, is it? Let's just say he does come in late 2015 and a baby has been born to a Christadelphian family in early 2015 and is therefore only a few months old. That child will be nearly two years old when its parents are immortalised. It will be aged 10 at Armageddon, aged 50 at the opening of the temple for worship. So it's 10, Armageddon, but between that period and the time when they're 50, you'd expect that they will have found someone to marry, whether that be another Christadelphian Will there be a Jew? We don't know. Found someone to marry. And they'll start their own family. Then when Christ takes his bride into the house and walks his bride around that house and begins the services, I'm pretty sure that those mortal Christadelphian children that now have an inheritance in the land and have their own young children will be there to see their immortal parents there at the inaugural ceremonies of the house of prayer for all nations. Won't that be terrific? And you'll be able to go and visit your grandchildren for decades and centuries thereafter. Grandchildren, great-grandchildren. Wonderful things, brothers and sisters, that our God has done for you and me. So Peter says, seeing that all these things are the present are thus to be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy living and godliness? We want these things. There is a way. But there's a warning. And here's my final slide. There is a warning. How glorious are the things we've been talking about? 
How glorious were the visions of the apocalypse. But this is how Christ finished the apocalypse. He said this. He that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy. Do you think that Christ is saying, brothers and sisters, that he doesn't care? That if we're unjust and unholy, that he doesn't care? That we don't change? No. He could never say that, could he? He does care. He does want us to change. He does want us to get our act together. But you know what he's saying at the end of the, apoc the apocalypse? He's saying, look, I've told you the whole history from the time of John. You know exactly where you are. And I have punctuated the whole of the apocalypse with all of these glorious visions of you being in the kingdom. I can't do any more for you than that. If you can't change with all of that, Nothing's going to change. Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me to give every man according as his work shall be. But soon there will be no opportunity to make the changes to our life that will see us there.